Hi, I'm Nishal Malik and you're watching In This Special. UNESCO estimates that the coronavirus pandemic has caused more than 90% of the world's students to be stuck at home. home. While the closing down of schools and universities is an essential step in curtailing community spread of the virus, the impact of this on learning and education is tremendous. Let's discuss this further. Joining us for this conversation today is Bela Raza Jamil, who is a CEO at Idara Italim O Agai, Center for Education and Consciousness and Commission of International Commission on Financing global education. She joins us from Islamabad. Also joining us today is Professor Alison Scott Bauman, who's a professor of society and belief at SOAS. She joins us from London. Thank you both for joining us and welcome to the show. Uh, professor Bauman, I'd like to jump in right into the conversation. What are the real time implications we're seeing on education as the matter unfolds, as each day passes by and we learn more about the situation? I think the university sector, I, could, I can speak quite clearly for the, for the university sector, is under huge pressure. Um, the students may not return. Uh, some may continue to learn online. That depends also on the quality of the online provision which is made. And that depends, of course, on the facilities that staff have available to them. So it's a very unpleasant, vicious circle. I think it would be possible to create higher education facilities for young people across the world, which are powerful and effective, but that will take time. And right. that means that current generations of students in, the in this next year or two years will not have the best deal. They will be an in they're like an interim generation while we're switching over to a different way of life. Of course, right. it's possible that we may return. I'll just finish the sentence. Of course, it's possible we may return to normal face-to-face -face teaching, but I think that's very unlikely. So we don't know what the nature of this blended learning will be, and I'm happy to talk about that more later. Right. We're, we're going to talk about that. The fact that you're saying that one or two years, of these students, this generation, they're not going to have the best learning um, outcome. Ms. Uh, Bela Raza, Talking about that and specific to the context of South Asia and what Pakistan is dealing with, do you agree with that or do you feel like that the impact of that might even be more long lasting, the implications might be more long lasting than one or two years? Well, um, as you know, even before this crisis, um, uh, we have uh, been uh, in what has been called a prolonged education emergency. So with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, it's even worse uh, because uh, it means that uh, for an indefinite period, our schools and universities and technical vocational institutions, everything is shut down. And uh, as it is, we were having problems with student attendance in normal times, but especially where uh, the poorest are going to be most affected where uh, income losses are going to be phenomenal, job losses will be phenomenal. Uh, the most vulnerable uh, person in any household ends up being the child, sometimes the most dispensable. So um, Pakistan has had uh, South Asia, uh, although it has one-fifth of the world's population, is also one of the most challenged of areas after sub-Saharan Africa when it comes to education, basic education as well. And uh, Pakistan, um, sadly, is way off its metrics on basic education, with almost 22.6 million children still out of school. So together with those who are out of school, now we'll have many more who will probably not return when the schools, whenever they do reopen. Or some may be temporarily withdrawn or may drop out, especially I worry for adolescent girls and boys. Right. Boys may be asked to go out to um, do odd jobs. Girls may be also withdrawn to become, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, more homebound to look after children and to look after siblings while their parents go out and work. Or they themselves may be asked to just stop schooling and go to work. And, you know, we've got some of the worst forms of child domestic labor around 
which uh, not just comes with the role of schools, but will also come with exploitation right. that is all over the place and with very poor social services when it comes to social support systems for children. Uh, Ms. Jamil, just on that point, all the slides that have been made so far, especially as you're talking about the inequalities that ha had already existed in South Asia, but all the strides that were made to try to close those gaps, do you feel like all of that could be undone, or is that uh, too much of an overestimation? Well, I, I, in some ways, you see, uh, COVID-19 has been quite a leveler. Uh, it has also, uh, we've seen quite an amazing response of uh, bureaucracies and politicians and civil society who have joined hands to uh, counter the uh, negative impact of this particular emergency. Uh, it is a very unusual emergency. It's very holistic. It affects so many uh, dimensions of our lives. But uh, what I do see is that uh, in spite of the fact that we are all trying to be very coherent, trying to work as one, the example being the teleschool that has opened through public, public, public and private partnerships, be that as it may, but, uh, you know, with resources that are going to be hugely depleted, depleted due to the economic right. crisis as well, we will, uh, in spite of all the goodwill, which I think is wonderful, in spite of all the blended learning that is sprung into action, which is, I think, wonderful, and some good content which is emerging, we will have a very major challenge of making sure that all the good that was done in the past or the challenges that we were facing with some kind of good responses will be further pressed for both resources and attention because there'll be so many other competing areas of attention. Right. Uh, Ms. Bela Raza Jamil, just finishing off the conversation with you, um, now, UNESCO focuses on the fact that during this time, sensitivity in terms of even remote teaching needs to be accounted for. The trauma and the struggles of young adults, of children especially, need to be factored in. Do you think that teaching programs are facing this issue? And do you think teachers are equipped to deal with this issue? And if not, what are some of the guidelines they need to follow? You see, in any uh, response to this crisis, one of the biggest issues is going to be how do you look at, um, uh, you know, the society out there? There are those who are privileged and those who are underprivileged. We have situations where we need to prepare for a spectrum approach from no tech to low tech to high tech. In the research that we've done as the annual status of education report on learning outcomes, we do household surveys and see clearly that even now, as we speak, overall in Pakistan, 40% of the households in rural areas do not have even television. So you may have a television program out there, but you've got lots of children who are still not being able to access that. Right. Radio usage is very low compared to television usage in rural areas. In urban, of course, situation gets reversed. And when you look at the use of cell phones, which is very decent, but still, when it comes to uh, coverage of cell phones, we again see that Pakistan is still not where it ought to be. You still have about 40, 50 percent people who still do not have phones in, in remote rural areas. And however, what is a redeeming feature is that we have uh, almost 80 percent with a preference to use right. WhatsApp. So wherever WhatsApp is going, things are you know, all this content is going right, very but well. But there definitely is, as you're saying, there is still this very evident gap. And uh, institutions, teachers especially, need to be cognizant of it while uh, remote on teaching is ongoing. And we don't know for how long that's going to remain the situation. Thank you so much, Ms. Bela Raza Jamil, for joining us from Islamabad, giving us your insight. Professor uh, Bowen, going back to you, I want to get to that point about blended uh, learning, blended teaching techniques you were talking about. But before that, I want to talk about especially the institution you're belonging to and other universities you're in contact with. How are they preparing for the future, especially the coming terms and the coming semesters? What are some of the guidelines they're following and what are they communicating to the students? Because there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of students for that specific reason are very agitated. Yes, that's a very good question. I think the, the situation is changing very fast. I can report to you at this point in time that a lot of British universities are working 
24-7 to create, uh, to improve the online platforms they already had. Because obviously, I mean, I've worked in Pakistan, you know that. I know that Britain is very privileged. So in relative terms, we have good online facility, we have good connectivity. But the, the variation across the sector is quite huge. So at SOAS, we have reasonably good provision, which we can upscale to provide more online teaching. Some universities are not so advanced, and some of the really big, wealthy universities are much more advanced. And this is an interesting issue about whether students may start to choose in the future what the electronic support is, what is the online support that they would get at that university, rather than, or more than, the calibre of the academics to whom they would have access. Right. So the game is changing completely in terms of, va of the values by which we seek to measure our higher education. Right. Uh, Professor, think, uh, yeah. I'll, since, since we're short on time, I want to get to that point that you highlighted earlier as well as what the future teaching techniques might look like, what uh, students can expect in the future, especially when we're talking about the next year, about the fall semester and the year after that. We know that this virus, this outbreak, is going to remain for a couple of months now. A lot of organizations are alluding towards that. What are some of the teaching techniques that need to be integrated? So the way, the way forward, as we understand at the moment, is to provide blended learning which would which would involve the universities opening again it would involve staff being present it would be involve staff using traditional techniques of their personality their their projection of their knowledge through their persona but that would be recorded now that's already happening but in order for that to be properly blended learning lecturers are also having to prepare a supplementary path, which is online learning. So instead of preparing a lecture and delivering it, staff are now having to prepare the lecture they will deliver and the supplementary learning, which must be made available to those who cannot be present. So it's like a two-track system. It's twice as much work. This could be brilliant, but it's a massive strain on the situation. If I could just close, I, I gather, I, I realize we're short of time. I just want to make a, a more holistic comment about the society's in which universities find themselves. These discrepancies between rich and poor, as Baella pointed out, are going to be much more marked now. And in a country like Britain, the fabric of society has been weakened by years of austerity. Now the fabric of society is being further weakened by so many people dying, important people dying in the lives of these students. You know, their parents, their sisters, their brothers, their children. 15% of the UK population is minority ethnic. But 93% of the doctors who are dying in this country from COVID are of minority ethnic origin. So it is in a country like this, like Britain, which is ethnic minority groups are so important to us, but they are the ones who are bearing the brunt of this disease. And that will have implications for already disadvantaged, socioeconomically disadvantaged families from Muslim backgrounds. Right. That's such an important point, and so much, Professor Allison Scott Bauman, for joining us and talking to us about it. Uh, it seems like the inequalities that already existed and institutions, organizations all across the world, world were focusing to try to close those gaps, those are just going to become that much more widened because of the ongoing pandemic. We're going to have to wait and see how the situation unfolds. But thank you to our guests for joining us and talking to us about it. We're going to go for a short break, but when we come back, we discuss disinformation campaigns surrounding the coronavirus. Stay with us. Welcome back to the show. Misinformation and coordinated disinformation campaigns are one of the greatest challenges we have in the modern age. This has probably become more obvious now during a pandemic than ever before. On today's show, we try to understand how these misleading conspiracies and myths are circulating on the internet, how they are being actively tackled, and who do they really benefit? 
Joining us for this conversation today is Usama Khilji, who's director of Bolobia, Pakistan-based policy and research organization focusing on digital rights and freedom of expression. He joins us from Islamabad. Also joining us today is Mr. Perligwik Vagnini, chief technology officer at Sybase, an IT security company joining us from Rome. Thank you both for joining us. And welcome to the show. Mr. Pagnini, I'd like to begin with you. Now, as early as Feb 2nd, the World Health Organization warned of a massive coronavirus infodemic, describing this as an influx of information and people wouldn't really be able to discern between facts and what's really going on and what's just plain misinformation. Now that we are four months into this pandemic, how do you see this infodemic evolving? What I can tell you is that three tackler exploit the interest in coronavirus outbreak while the number of infected people increase worldwide. With my team, uh, I'm monitoring a new campaign every day. The attacks are carried out by both cyber criminal and organization and also nation state actors. It is not easy for ordinary users to find trustworthy sources. We are in the middle of a perfect storm. Consider that people are isolated and are working from home due to the lockdown. This makes them more exposed to cyber attacks and misinformation campaigns. Right. Now, specifically talking about these misinformation campaigns, who really is behind them? Do we know so far from the reports coming out, from analyses, who really is conducting these coordinated campaigns? I can tell you that a growing number of threat actors is exploiting the coronavirus as a lure. Uh, last week, for example, FBI announced that the number of cybercrime reports is spiking in the beginning of coronavirus pandemic. So we have the first motivation that could be the cybercrime. But most, more interesting is the data provided by security firms. For example, Google uh, is warning that nation state actors are exploiting the coronavirus pandemic to target healthcare organizations and entities worldwide. Just to give you an idea of this campaign, uh, Google announced that its antivirus solution implemented to defend Gmail users have blocked around 80 million phishing and malware-based attacks using the COVID-19 uh, lures with, in just seven days. Uh, let me say that these are numbers of a silent information warfare activity. Right. Um, Osama, jumping to you and talking a little about how individuals can actually maneuver through all the information that's out there on the internet. Now, you work with uh, an organization that talks about digital rights and information sharing. And many individuals who share misinformation believe that it is their right to do so, that it is their freedom of expression. What do people need to keep in mind during a pandemic like this? As you rightly said, during a pandemic, I think it's very critical that all the information that is, that is shared is reliable. And because it's something that's health related, any misinformation can be very dangerous for people. So I think that's where the line has to be drawn where people's life and health can be risked. Uh, so I think, uh, What's very, very important is for everyone to realize that the most important actors in this pandemic are medical experts, and those are the people we should be listening to. So in that vein, I think the World Health Organization has been coordinating a lot of um, information dissemination. And then the local health uh, authorities have also been working in tandem with the World Health Organization in order to raise awareness regarding uh, what the precautions are that people should take in order to avoid contracting the virus. And I think these are the two main uh, sources that most citizens should be relying on. Um, in order to ascertain whether that information is authentic or not, uh, I think it's very important to refer to only the websites of these health authorities as well as their social media presence, rather than relying on uh, forwarded messages uh, on WhatsApp or reading you know, non-expert views on social media. Right. Osama, on that point of uh, forward messages on WhatsApp, it seems like WhatsApp is trying to tackle that and various other social media platforms also realize the danger of, of false information, misinformation circulating around. Could you take us through some of the policies that you feel like are working for these platforms when they're trying to tackle misinformation? I think what one very important step that WhatsApp has taken is um, disabled uh, the option of forwarding of a viral message 
to more than one person. So at first, you could forward a message to 20 people, then they reduced it to five, and there are a lot of issues uh, in uh, India due to, you know, WhatsApp forward message related violence. And now you can only forward a message in several territories to only one person. And I think that's a good step uh, in order to contain the spread of misinformation. I liken the spread of misinformation, disinformation to the spread of the coronavirus. So if uh, you get a, in, an incorrect message and it is forwarded to you, you're likely to forward it to say five or 10 people. But if your ability, technical ability to forward it to several people reduces, then it's likely that you're not going to be forwarding that messages to way too many people. So I think that's one important step that WhatsApp has taken. And I think um, the other platforms like Google and Facebook and Twitter are also working with local authorities in order to tackle misinformation right. on the internet. And I've, we've seen a lot of reports of uh, wrongful messages being taken down by these platforms. Right. Osama, I'm going to come back uh, in a or so to that point of how these social media firms are collaborating with uh, local org uh, organizations and governments. But before that, I want to jump back to Mr. Pagnini and talk to him about the EU versus Disinfo uh, report that was released on April 24th. Now, it stated that uh, in order to deflect blame for the mishandling of this coronavirus, we're seeing a circulation of misinformation. Has COVID-19, has the coronavirus become almost a battleground of uh, information war, wars between states? I have no doubt that we are assist assisting to a coordinated misinformation campaigns that attempt to influence the sentiment of population on specific topics. For example, UAE authorities have already identified the multiple, multiple coordinated disinformation campaigns being promoted by three actors coming from China, Iran, and Russia, and they are exploiting the interest on the coronavirus pandemic. Right, they're exploiting this, and about the fact, fact that when we have governments, especially uh, like the United States, where the leader is spewing out misinformation on a daily basis almost, and that influences the spread of information. How is that being dealt with? It's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite hard to, to fight misinformation campaign. As you told, uh, as, you tell, uh, as you are telling right now, uh, I can tell you that disinformation campaign are today used by almost every government. Every government is attempting to use social media to, to promote, uh, to, to influence the sentiment of foreign states. So uh, I believe that in order to fight misinformation com campaign, we need the coordinated effort of government worldwide. This means that we must immediately share any kind of information related to ongoing campaign, and we have to collaborate with the private industries in order to fight the spread of information. Right. Mr. Pagnini, now you're talking to us from one of the most worst affected uh, regions in the world. And as you mentioned that there is a need to coordinate and there is a need for transparency. Those were some of the most essential guidelines that were put out as soon as we found out that we're in the midst of a pandemic. And it still seems each and every government is uh, still trying to deflect from their accountability from what they're doing wrong. How is that damaging the fight against this virus? I believe that is the, the greatest damages. You have to consider that, yes, sure, we are fighting with a pandemic, but today the world are economic wars. When you spread an information, you can have an impact on the economy. This means that every government is using the information to attempt the, to influence the economy of its, uh, its position uh, against other states and the overall global economy. Spreading a specific information could, gi could give to specific government a great advantage. This is the main reason uh, that is causing the lack of transparency in this sense. Right. Osama, on that similar point, I was talking to Mr. Pagnini about, especially when we talk about the United States, where the leader is uh, constantly promoting bizarre sort of solutions, bizarre information. Now, that is information that becomes news and therefore it circulates, even though it's the responsibility of journalists and news organizations not to spread out misinformation, just the nature of the fact that it's news it spreads more. 
Are there any guidelines during this time that you feel like should be given to journalists, should be given to media organizations on how to deal with such a messy situation? Absolutely. I think the editorial powers that media organizations have should be used to put disclaimers. So after Trump um, insinuated that, you know, possibly we could use disinfectants as uh, injections, we saw a lot of media organizations in the U.S. putting out um, alerts uh, and messaging to people, telling them not to consume disinfectants. Um, and I think we also saw companies and producers of disinfectants come out and tell uh, their, their customers not to use these. And I think on social media as well, we've seen um, how Twitter took down two posts by the Brazilian president because they were factually incorrect and potentially dangerous for people to use. So in that sense, the social media companies and uh, media companies, I think, are trying to uh, fix the harm done by irresponsible leaders worldwide. Right, and that is a quite a, an uphill task. Just getting to that point that I was holding you on to, which was how are these social media organizations collaborating with local governments? We know that that is a necessity in this day and age. We've seen the problems when that isn't being done. How do you think they're working with that? So uh, I think so far, if you go on any any social media platform, you see on the top of your, uh, your home screen, uh, resources related to coronavirus that you can click on and then go and you can access information. I think they've translated a lot of that to local languages as well. Um, I know that WhatsApp has collaborated with the World Health Organization on a on a helpline uh, in which you can chat and ask questions. It's automated and it gives you answers. And, and they've localized that with the Ministry of Health Services in Pakistan as well. So there's a phone number linked, uh, a WhatsApp number that you can message and get access to information related to the virus. So I think there's that sort of like um, collaboration taking place between companies and governments, which is good to see, because we need uh, such uh, important filtering of misinformation and what better way than to put out the reliable information at the top of everyone's feet. Right. On that point, thank you so much, Osama Kildi, for us taking out the time to talk to us. Uh, Mr. Pignini, now, how essential is a trust between governments and civilians at this point in time? And I'm especially referring to anti-government conspiracies that are circulating all across the world. How important is that trust element to fight this virus? is essential. It's essential because the government have to share any kind of information related to coordinating misinformation campaigns, and they have to work together in order to identify the source of these campaigns. It is an odd job, but without any agreement between the government, it is impossible to track down the sources of misinformation campaign. So the collaboration is essential. Right. I just want to talk to you about one conspiracy theory in particular that has been making quite a lot of rounds, which is related to 5G networks and 5G technology. What do we know so far about that? Well, I can tell you that probably 5G is the, the most interesting topic right now in the IT industries. Uh, we are in the middle of an economic war related to the 5G, the 5G technologies, they deployment worldwide. So we know that we have China on one side that is, that is pushing its technology worldwide, and on the other side, we have Western organization, the US, for example, that is asking its allies to don't use any kind of uh, uh, Chinese equipment. equipment. Uh, it's natural that the first misinformation campaign could be coordinated in order to uh, attack this kind of technologies. Because as I told you, we are in the middle of an economic war. Right on that point, thank you so much for, uh, for Luigi Pagnini for joining us from Rome. Now we're joined by Mr. Philip Ingram, who's a journalist specializing in security and intelligence. He joins us from Birmingham. Thank you so much, Mr. Ingram, for taking out the time and talking to us. Now, we've been talking about who benefits from the spread of disinformation, from this mis misinformation, really, when this is a pandemic, something in which all actors need to be on the same page and fight one common enemy. What do you think, uh, who really is behind these disinformation, coordinated disinformation campaigns? 
Well, there's a number of different people behind the disinformation campaigns. There's individuals themselves, themselves who just want to be bad um, and, and, and stir problems. Uh, they're not the big problem. There are um, nation states who are behind it and they want to do two things. One, uh, send a message out to their domestic audience that um, things are not as bad as they are in reality and try and hide that message. And the second thing is to further their international political um, aspirations by trying to find friction points in uh, um, some international political organizations and put this information knife in the crack and wiggle it to try and make the crack a little wider. The, the information itself isn't going to cause a massive problem, but they're um, refocusing people away from the main effort in that country and continuing to try and uh, maintain some form of political disharmony um, mm. is a want of a better way of doing it. And they're using the old Chinese style of death of a thousand cuts. So they'll do lots of different activities over the years to do that. And then, um, and then the, the final people who are looking at disinformation are those that are trying to provide that information in there in a way that they can then exploit it for criminal purposes. So putting out... Um, uh, cries about lack of supply of a particular item and then phishing emails go out to say we can supply this from here and that's that's from false accounts around the place so organized criminals are are, are making huge amounts of money from it so there's three different levels um, and all of them unfortunately are operating at the same time right and that's a great thread when so much is happening online so many users their activity is increasing online they're absorbing all this information but just jumping to that point about political friction being created through these information wars or you know trying to wiggle in uh, misinformation do you think that's uh, working at this point that political friction is manifesting itself well, it does work, and it's worked over, over a long period of time. You know, the, the Russians who are behind a lot of this, or those that follow Russian-type doctrine, um, have got a doctrine for it, and it's called Maskarovka, masking. Now, it's nothing new. Um, it goes, if you go back to the 6th century, the great Chinese philosopher and general Sun Tzu turned around and said, um, all warfare is deception, all deception is warfare. Um, and we've seen um, the accusations of potential influence into uh, the US presidential elections. Well, it uh, would make sense if you want to continue to have that sort of political influence um, to look at the, the cracks that there are within the political systems in the United States and fire information in there um, into those cracks and wiggle it to, because the president, US presidential elections are happening later on this year. We've got a new government in the UK that has got um, a huge amount of strength um, within it because it's got a majority in the, the Houses of Parliament. So try and undermine that by providing information that you know the more extreme elements of the opposition will jump on um, and, and, and believe without actually doing the research behind it. Uh, and that happens. You've got Europe that is in a position where it could potentially fracture because we've seen Europe go into um, national focused close down and not work as a single EU entity that's out there, that would then um, allow a power bloc that wants to influence what's going on in Europe the opportunity to try and suggest that uh, things aren't working from a Europe perspective and fire those sorts of information campaigns in, uh, furthering longer term political um, aspirations that have been planned over a number of years and are being executed over a large number right. of years. Right. On that point, thank you so much, Philip Ingram, for joining us, taking out the time to talk to us. Now we're joined by Professor Rifat Atun, who's a professor of global health systems at Harvard University. He joins us from London. Thank you so much, Professor Atun, for joining us and welcome to the show. I'm going to dive right into it and especially talk about some of the most prevalent misconceptions we're hearing in the global landscape. Uh, landscape. One of them especially being the origins of this virus. Where has it come from? Is it, uh, do we know for sure yet that it has come from a wet market? There's so much speculation. And as Mr. Ingram was previously talking about, a lot of information is being, uh, is being weaponized and being used by states to create friction. What do we know so far about this? Yes, there are many conspiracy theories uh, circulating on the social media. And with any crisis, there are always uh, conspiracy theories. Um, so how do, how do viruses emerge, um, especially coronavirus, the SARS-2? Uh, the evidence currently suggests that this actually um, originated in animals, then jumped to humans. And the reason for this uh, transition is because we have destroyed uh, both animal ecosystems as well as human ecosystems. And this animals and uh, humans coming into close proximity 
uh, has, has enabled these transmissions. And sometimes viruses that are pathogenic uh, pass to humans, or sometimes viruses that are not pathogenic pass to humans and then mutate and become, uh, become pathogenic. Now, what the current evidence we have suggests that um, this, this is a, um, a transmission from animal to human and then human to human. There is no evidence to suggest that this, is, uh, uh, this virus was developed in a laboratory because analyzing the genome of the virus suggests that this is uh, in line with what might expect. Right. So scientific evidence is against the conspiracy theories. Right, Professor Azun, thank you for specifically stating that there that we have no evidence for those conspiracy theories or backing those conspiracy theories that this was in fact created in a lab. Another thing that is talked about a lot, especially when economies want to uh, move towards reopening themselves, is how much immunity does one develop after contracting uh, COVID-19? Do we know if that will lead to herd immunity or not? A lot of conversation about it, a lot of people giving a lot of opinions, but you're the expert here. What do we know about immunity so far? This is an excellent question. In fact, uh, WHO uh, initially issued um, a scientific briefing, to say, technical briefing, to say that um, having antibodies, having been exposed to the infection did not confer, un uh, did not confer immunity. But then the following day, they issued another um, message, a tweet, to say that uh, apologies, uh, this has caused confusion. Uh, infection is likely to lead to some kind of immunity. So the evidence, uh, as far as we know, suggests, uh, based on our knowledge of how coronaviruses behave, is that an, an individual who has been exposed to the infection develops antibodies, and then this confers some level of immunity. Now, what we're not certain about is what is the extent of this immunity? How strong is it? And how long will the body remember this, uh, this immunity to be able to mount a response later on? So we don't know the level, we don't know the length, but evidence to date suggests that there is some kind of immunity right. that an individual gains. Right. I mean, I wish we could talk more about this and we will do so in the future. But thank you so much, Professor Rifat Atun, for joining us from London, talking to us about some of the most prevalent misconceptions that we're hearing about and at least debunking them so that individuals base their arguments on facts and not fiction. Thank you for watching in this special. We will see you again next week with more stories. Till then, goodbye and take care. Thank you.